before and now meeting now. Um, so I'd love to chat with all of you guys after. But, so I'm with the National Echo Tech Center and what I'm gonna be talking about today, I'm actually gonna be doing the, the later afternoon training as well, talking about the facilitating play for children of all abilities. But right now I just wanna talk about the power of play, why that's so important, and a little bit um, about our Echo Tech program and how your library can benefit and how the families that you serve can benefit. So, what we always like to talk about at Echo Tech is that we're always these big advocates on play. We're these experts on toys. I actually have some toys for us to play with a little bit later too. But um, part of our white paper, which is a research-based paper that we actually have on our website, I didn't bring one for everybody, but one of the quotes in there is, when a child enters the world of play, she also enters the realm of potential and possibilities. What do you guys think about that? Duh, right? <laughs> yeah, of course they do. Um, and especially for children with special needs, we always really need to be advocates for them. And I think libraries are such a great opportunity for families to participate in different play programming. Um, so when you look at the website, the white paper, it's called Potential and Possibilities because we thought it was so impactful. And this is little Jenny. So kind of just to give you our mission, and I am going to read it aloud to you, I know you guys all read, but play is the way kids learn, develop skills, and reach milestones. The National Echo Tech Center mission is to make the world of play accessible for all children, especially those who have disabilities or special needs. Toys and play help kids reach their full potential and increase inclusion within the family and community. So all the things that we do, all of our programming, all of our um, adventures with industry relations, all of our different partnerships, it's all going back to this mission. We're all about trying to make play accessible for children of all abilities and families. So just a little facts and stats about disabilities. There are 313.9 million people in the United States. 57 million people have a disability. One in five people have a disability. That's what it breaks down to. And 10 to 12 of those are children with disabilities. And that equals one in 20 kids have a disability. That's a huge number. So whenever you're going to the library or to the park, if there's 20 kids around, there's bound to be one of them that has a disability, whether you can see it or not, whether it's diagnosed or not. There's always going to be a disability there. So it's our responsibility to really make sure that we're providing accessible play for these children. Um, to segue into something really cute, this is Grace. And have you guys, have you guys ever played with um, bristle blocks? Yeah, so, I actually think I have a laser on this. <laughs> uh, so, what we normally do when we're playing with bristle blocks is you build them, you build a house, you build a car, you can do all these different things with them. But, when we were with Grace, she wanted to have a hair salon. She used it as a brush, which, again, duh, they look exactly like a brush, but that's not the way that I would play with it. That's no, not the way some other people would play with it, but Grace did. And we always talk about and advocate for there is no wrong way to play. And especially in our training later this afternoon, there's different techniques that you can do to really observe and follow the child's lead. And this is one of them. Grace had an idea in her head of how she wanted to play with this, what she wanted to do, what her creativity, her imagination was going to let her do. She wanted to have a hair salon. But I went in there with a different mindset. So I had to tweak and change what I was thinking. So that's, that always kind of goes back to, I feel like that should be snuck into our mission too, because there is no wrong way to play. Um, so always keep that in mind. Again, this is a little excerpt from our um, white paper. And I apologize, I know it's a little bit difficult to see. But this is talking about the inherent benefits of different play experiences, whether it's with a therapist, whether it's at a library, whether it's um, you know, with a sibling, with a parent. <clears throat> There's all these different developmental milestones that we're striving for, especially children with special needs. You know, we're always trying to um, excel their skills and, and find accessible play. But, so we broke this down into a couple different categories. We have physical, social, emotional, cognitive. What's not listed on here is sensory development and communicative development. Um, but those are definitely important as well. So part of this chart, talking about the physical development, one of my favorites on there is talking about how play can provide you with a healthy body. Our bodies crave to move. This is why it's so bad that recess is getting cut in different schools because children, their bodies love to move. Our bodies love to move. You know when they say, when you're stressed, just go for a jog, it'll feel so good. I haven't tried that. <laughs> but I do do yoga. Um, but your body is wanting, wanting that movement, wanting um, to develop those different skills, whether it's fine motor, gross motor skills, and you can achieve those through play. Um, 
talking about social development, one of my favorites on there is confidence. You know, at Lacco Tech, we're, and I'll talk about the program in a little bit, but we're always trying to get grants, and we have to report on these different outcomes. Well, how do you measure confidence in a child? That's really hard to do. Um, and courage, it takes confidence and courage to climb that tree, to do those monkey bars, to walk on that high uh, balance beam, whatever it is. And we don't necessarily think about that all the time, about how they're working on their social development while they're outside playing on a playground or sitting on a play rug and playing with toys. Uh, emotional development. Again, we talk a little bit about courage there and confidence again, but one of my favorites is the sense of wonder. Have you ever seen a child playing with a toy or whatever they're doing outside and you see kind of that twinkle, that spark in their eye, and you can see that the gears are turning and they're just amazed. They're, they think it's so wonderful. That's one of my favorite things that I get to see doing the things that I do at work, but that's great for parents, that's good for librarians, and it's great for that child to have that, that awe feeling. You know, when I put a bubble machine on and then the bubbles start spreading out and they are just so amazed. That's an inherent benefit that we gain from play. Cognitive development, as you can see, these are getting higher and higher because there's just more and more benefits that you can get through play working on towards your development. So cognitive development, I mean, that's your creativity, that's your problem solving skills. Creativity is huge, uh, and all the things that we do with Grace and the Bristle Blocks, how she wanted to start a hair salon, with any arts and crafts activities that you do in any of your story times, whatever it may be, that's working on their cognitive development. When you're playing grocery store and they have to add up one banana, one apple, and one tree. <coughs> That's working on their problem solving and their mathematical skills, their cognitive development. So a lot of us already know this, that of course play is not frivolous, it's very, very important, and it's really working on the development of, of the kids that we see, and especially kids with um, special needs. But this is for, and I always say that our white paper is kind of for the non-believers out there, for the people that don't really understand why play is so important and why it's important not to cut out weaknesses and why it's not, um, it's not uh, important to do that because we're working on those different skill developments always. So again, it's a little slow transition. Um, again, now we're talking about benefits of parent-rich child play experiences. Now, this doesn't necessarily just have to be parent-child. It's kind of facilitator-child, whoever it may be. But how we're both getting different things as a parent or as a facilitator and as a child. Um, one of the things for parents is, and for children is being able to see each other in a different world. Um, I play for my job full-time. I play all the time on the rug. And... I can bark like a dog and hop like a frog and roar like a lion, but when parents are doing it, it's way better. It's way funnier. It's way more engaging when a parent is doing it. And I think kids like to see their parents playing that different role. Um, so seeing them in a different area, the parent actually entering the child's world, sitting on that rug, you know, wherever your play space is, being in that playground, I think that's important for the child to see their parent in their world. And also for the child, or for the parent, to be in that child's world, because they're also seeing that sense of wonder. They're seeing, oh, Grace is so clever. She wants to do a hair salon. Picking up those little things, getting to know each other a little bit more. That play disposition and that play relationship is different than doing the laundry and feeding and um, taking a bath. I mean, you, you add play to all those elements, but when dedicated playtime, it's different, and you're really entering their world. So I think that's very, very important. Um, also, and I know I'm weighing heavy on the special needs because we see children of all abilities, but being able to be inclusive in the family. Sometimes we don't think about that. We think about being inclusive in all these different community settings, going to the library, going to the movie theater, wherever it is. But also just being inclusive in the family. Sometimes when you have an older sibling and a younger sibling, not even depending on their ability-wise, it's hard to get them to engage with each other and play together. But that's something that play can really unite kids of different ages and families um, with different preferences and personalities. So now talking about our actual program, what do I do at Lacrotech? Um, so I have, you guys have passed around the kind of membership form. So I'm going to briefly kind of talk about all the things that entail in our membership. And it's on your little postcard. It says, why play? 
What we do at Lacco Tech is we meet with families. They um, join a membership with Lacco Tech, which is a yearly membership. They come in once a month for an hour-long play specialist with their family play specialist. And we're striving for the same goals that they're working on at home, at school, in their therapies. And we're striving for those same goal goals, but trying to use toys and play as kind of our prescription, I guess. We, you know, we have these prescriptive toys that we use if you're working on any um, kind of developmental skills that you're working towards. We're striving for those same goals, but being a little bit sneaky about it and introducing different toys and making play accessible for these children so that they can reach those milestones, they can meet their, reach their potential. So that hour-long play session, um, siblings are welcome to attend. It's not just that child that has a special need because the whole family has a special need, right? It's not just Timmy with cerebral palsy who now needs to figure out how to play together as family. You guys all need to figure out how to play as a family. So parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever is really involved in that child's life comes to our play sessions. Um, actually, just recently I had about nine adults in a room and two little kids because the family members were in town and they don't know how to play with Mia. She has a lot of physical issues and limitations and barriers through play and they just didn't know how to play with her. So they asked if they could all come in and I said, sure. So we had nine adults in there. We're all talking about different ways to play and access toys and position her, all these different things that they may have not known about, but they so badly want to play with Mia. Yeah. So is the yearly membership, doesn't matter if you've got 20 in your family or two in your family? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this relates to all of our programs too. So all of our play groups, all of our, I'll talk about a little bit, nature programs, um, whatever it is, those are all our camps. They're all for the family. So you have eight kids. All right. Eight kids can come. And I think, you know, that's different than a lot of the therapies or the other kind of programs that some of these children might be in because it is just a very dedicated time for them, which is wonderful, which is great. But that doesn't always translate back at home because you're always going to have brother and sister with you. You're always going to have older sister, maybe uncle lives with you. There's all these different elements that don't necessarily represent what the life of the child actually is. Um, so meet once a month for an hour-long play session. At the end of that session, they're able to take five or more toys home, which is great because so this toy lending aspect of LacoTech is wonderful because over here I have a couple of adaptive toys which are very expensive, which really kind of work on the different um, abilities of the child. But children are always growing. They're always gaining new skills. They want to play with the box and not the actual toy that's in, in the box. With the Toy Lending Library, they're able to get new toys every month, so the novelty never wears off. They're always working on those different skills, and they're always getting something new, and we're catering, catering to the whole family. Um, our program really kind of, we're all about trying to adapt play and make it accessible, and our program is like that too. We try to mold it to the families that need it, and what, what things are they gaining from our program. Um, we're going to highlight those different things. <coughs> So they take five or more toys, next month they get five other toys. So it's just like a library. They bring them back, they give them more toys every month. Um, we also have social play groups, which are one Saturday a month, which focus on social skills, on sensory activities, kind of a lot like what a story time probably looks like in your library, but not as many books. <laughs> um, and those are super, super great and really are uh, creating a great community within the Laco Tech families that So our, our membership is $300 for the full year. We do have scholarships and payment plans and different options available for families because we really want to get these toys into the hands of the family that really need them, right? Um, and $300 is still a lot of money for some families. Even if you're breaking it down, even if you're um, eligible for one of our scholarships, it can be a lot of money. So we try to jam pack our membership with as much stuff as we can. Um, so we offer parent support groups, which we do offer child care to come, you have to take care of their kids, too. So we have offer parent support groups, which we have a number of different organizations and professionals and therapists come in and just talk about their expertise and offer a really safe, welcoming, warm environment for these families to come in and talk about what's going on. We had somebody from TheraPlay Institute talking about medical trauma just recently, and we had another woman talking about the techniques of using brain gym. Um, and all these
these different all these different things, which is just an opportunity again for parents to understand what resources are out there for them. And actually putting a face with a name because a lot of these parents of parents of children with special needs, they're gonna have a lot of things thrown at them. They'll have a lot of pieces of paper, a lot of postcards, a lot of business cards, a lot of information. And it's hard to sift through all of that and find out what program will actually work great with my family. Yeah. Do you guys target certain ages? That's a great question. We work with families um, zero to eight years old. Okay. So, and we kind of, it's a soft eight. We don't kick anybody out of our program. They can kind of graduate out of our program. Mm -hmm. But kids tend to naturally kind of um, lean away from toys a little bit when they get older, then they get into school and they right. have organized sports and a couple things like that. And we probably have to open up another Lacotech just to house the toys for the older kids. <laughs> um, but that's a great question. Okay. So it's great, you know, if, you, if anybody of you guys are familiar with early intervention, that serves families zero to three years old. And then when they age out at three years old, what do some of them do? Some of them get uh, qualified for other services and can get therapy and, and get an IEP, but some families don't qualify. So Lapotech has really kind of filled a, a gap a little bit for some of those families that are age out of EI at three years old, but still need something. They need something especially to help talking about play and reaching those goals um, in Lapotech. Um, I work a lot like a social worker. Um, I'm always kind of making referrals and finding resources for different families. Hey, I want a swimming program, but none of these seem to work in my community. Where can I go? Hey, what libraries offer you know story times for kids with special needs? All of this information I'm getting all the time and trying to pass that along to my families. So if any of you guys, I have my business cards too, if any of you guys have any programming or anything specific for special needs, Please, you know, let me know, and I can afford it. We are in Chicago, so some of you guys I know we're all dispersed everywhere. But um, I'm always ready to email, blast my families, and provide them with a lot of information and resources and referrals. We have special events. We have a holiday party that I've been planning right now. Um, different admissions and attractions. What we try to do is we try to get passes and discounted rates for different play spaces, museums, whatever it is. Um, because a lot of the families that we work with maybe are a little bit more isolated and don't feel comfortable going to the children's museum with their child with a disability or my child has autism and I don't know if we can go to this play cafe. Well these are experiences that we want our families to have and to figure out and what do you do now. If you want a cup of coffee and you want to sit and let your kid play, well, I want to give you that opportunity. So by providing these passes or having a field trip and us all going together, I can go with the family first, or Lacotech can go with the family first, and really kind of talk about the barriers to the building. I mean, accessibility issues, still buildings aren't all accessible. So talking about these different things is really trying to empower the parents a little bit, too. And the, and the families that we work with to say, hey, you can go to the museum with, with your three children. One of them's in a wheelchair and one has autism. Trying to say, you can do it. Here's how you can do it. So I think it's really empowering and rewarding for the families. Um, and we also, we're all about education and trying to find, um, offer different learning opportunities for our families and professionals that we see. So we have webinars, which are once a month. Again, those are on various topics. We're actually, um, We've had people talking about timeouts and tantrums and people talking about how beneficial rough house play can be and a number of different things that these parents can tune in from home, these professionals can tune in from home and really gain this knowledge and, you know, have baby in the corner, which I think is a really accessible way for parents to learn. As well as we offer different trainings uh, throughout the year as well. Um, this one in the afternoon, facilitating play, and we do that about four times a year in-house at Lago Tech that's free for parents. So we're just trying to offer as much resources and education for our families as possible, as well as toys. This is, these are just a couple of pictures of our therapeutic play sessions. And Lago Tech, I didn't even say this, Lago Tech is a Swedish word, it's a Swedish made-up word, um, for play library. Um, it actually started in the 1970s and Sweden, and then we brought it back here. It actually started in Evanston, Illinois in 1980. It 
these two special educators that went, had a child with a special need, loved the program, and then brought it back to the U.S. Um, we are a network of 17 affiliates, so we are a national organization. Um, the one in Chicago is the national site. And I was just actually in North Dakota because we opened up a LACOTEC in North Dakota going there and training their staff to serve the families that they see. So, you know, we're always expanding and always getting bigger and LACOTEC can fit in so many different environments. So, like I was talking about before about these kind of community partnerships and these, these um, passes that we're getting at museums in different places, we also are involved um, in integrating the families into the community in other areas as well. Libraries have been amazing. You know, I think I'm preaching to the choir, obviously. Mm -hmm. But what we find is a lot of kids with special needs, they go to these special places. They go to the special clinic. They go to the special school. They go to the special doctor. At the library, it's already a community center. They're all, it's already in the hub, in the community of their town. They're able to just go there and not feel like it's just a special place for them to go. Yes, it's special because we all love our libraries. But it's not you know, a secluded, um, <coughs> exclusive place for these families to go to. So it's very inclusive, and we've partnered up, and Renee and I have have really spearheaded the, the sensory story times and really gone to a number of different libraries to be able to provide these sensory story times. Um, what I find, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but that we're wanting these story times so badly, um, but don't have the staff or the time to actually execute them. That's been the biggest thing, but having LACOTEC come in, bring our bag of stuff, lead it, and then leave, I think that's great because you can say that you're offering programming for kids with special needs, led by you know experts on you know what we're doing and what we're talking about. Um, and then you guys don't have to do as much work because that's that's hard. I know there's so much stuff to do. So that's been a really great um, great accomplishment, I think, and it's been really fun. I love being able to see all the different libraries and go in and all the libraries have different patrons. You know, it's some have older kids, some have younger kids, um, who really are um, the ones that are coming to the library. So, I love I love doing those. Um, yeah, I have another question. Yeah, but the same question. No, so, please. the sensory story time. What age is that usually like working? Like what bracket? Of age? So, I usually say three to eight years old. Okay. Um, and I know it's kind of a, a larger range, and I even have some younger kids too. The only reason is because we want to capture the whole family. So if you have a three-year-old with special needs, but they have an eight-year-old brother, sure. they can come to our story time. I don't want them to not come to our story time, or they're nine years old and they don't come to the story time. Trying to really just kind of have a wider range of families to come. And little ones too, I mean, little ones can come. I've had babies and two-year-olds come to our story times, which is fine, which is great, um, but kind of, our activities are going to be geared to kind of the three to eight year old. And so you bring your like adaptive toys and you do books then? Is that yeah. kind of your format? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what our format is, is, you know, we have about three books that we read um, and we have three different activities. So I'll have a gross motor, um, kind of a more active activity. Um, then I will do like a craft, kind of a fine word activity, a craft or something kind of sitting at the table kind of get them focused a little bit. And then a sensory activity. I think that's really important. I mean, obviously it's in the title of what it is, a sensory story time. But trying to, learning, you know, obviously learning is going to be more beneficial and helpful and more impactful when you kind of engage all of the senses. So when you read, when you see, when you look, when you smell, when you taste, all those different things. We were reading the book, and it has a long title, but The Mouse with the Big Strawberry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. One. So we made like strawberry Play-Doh, and we you and that was another sensory experience. So they could smell the, the strawberry, but mold it with their hands. They We used dirt and twigs and leaves to actually go when we were going on a bear hunt. It's a bear thing. Um, and then going on a bear hunt. So all these different things really kind of capture the child's imagination and creativity and attention um, and engages all so, and then we usually have an opening song and then a closing activity. Whatever it is, I think consistency is really helpful. Sometimes we always don't get to our closing activity, but I always end with a parachute because that's always fun. It's for children of all abilities on all ability levels. Um, and it's kind of a signifier that, okay, we're done. We're done with story time now. Um, and then we have a simple opening song and just kind of putting those in order that you think is the best way to do it. Um, we also offer a professional
professional toy lending program. So a couple of libraries are part of our professional toy lending program that are able to check out toys from us as well, just like the parents um, and the families are able to. But say, hey, I want toys to enhance my story times, or I want toys to be able um, for checkout for families to use in the library. There's all these different products, but what if you have a child that might not be able to access some of your great toys that you already have in the library? Being able to offer, I don't want to say special toys, because I already kind of said that I don't want to do that, but offering these, you know, these great additions to toys that you already have in your library, I think is beneficial for the patrons that you're serving. Um, <coughs> and that part of that professional toy lending program, you're able to have access to all of our webinars and our different trainings too, which I think you know we're always trying to educate ourselves and have this professional development. I think our webinars and some of our trainings can really do that for the, the people that we see, professionals we see. One of, another one of our big things We've done a plant and play camp, which kind of just set the stage a little bit. Have you has anybody heard of like nature deprivation? Yeah. So yeah, Joe, I know you have. Um, so with nature deprivation, it's you, children being deprived of having being surrounded by natural elements and having these sensory experiences and learning and growing cognitively through nature and play. And that's something that is lacking. And they say in nature deprivation is a, an, a higher risk for children with special needs. They're already kind of feeling a little secluded, and maybe they're not outside getting dirty, and they know what a tree looks like, but they don't know what bark feels like, which I think that's, that's scary to think about, that our kids aren't going outside and playing and getting dirty. So we had this initiative. We paired up with the Chicago Botanic Gardens, which is in Glencoe. If you guys haven't been there, it's beautiful. It's an amazing, amazing attraction in the city of Chicago, in the state of Illinois, really. And we offered um, a camp. We called it Plant and Play, which is the first time the Botanic Gardens have ever offered any programming for kids with special needs. So we were really excited. But then I was like, OK, now I have to be a camp counselor. Um, but what we did is, again, we kind of took the same theme a lot, the same ideas from our story times, introducing a lot of literacy in our programming, being outside, all these different sensory experiences. And paired, again, always in the back of our head, we had those kind of developmental skills, that skill development that we're working on throughout the camp. So it was truly amazing. The whole family was involved. We had got a lot of feedback saying this is the first time that the boys have actually ever been able to do anything together um, as a family. It was an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. And that was just really empowering. You know, there was another family that the parents got really close, and the son, the sons kind of liked each other, but I think with more the parents. But he had a birthday party, and they invited the little boy, Charlie, and it was the first birthday party that he had ever gone to. And he was five years old, and I think that's amazing, creating those connections within the family in already an open, beautiful, nature-filled space, um, and creating all these kind of nature-inspired activities and um, games. And, oh, it was a lot of fun, and that's what we're really trying to to Skokie and a couple of nature centers as well and just doing these different field trips, trying to just engage in nature a little bit more because parents don't want grass stains on the knees and they don't want mud in their hands and they don't want twigs stuck in their hair or climbing a tree. But that's something that we want to have. We want our kids to get dirty. We want them to be creative. We want them to have these great sensory experiences because they can take a bath and you can hose them off and then everything will be good. <laughs> Um, and here's a couple pictures of our sensory story times. Um, this one right here, I don't even remember what we were doing. I think we were sorting different colors and making necklaces. And then again, the parachute, that's always the big one because you can do it sitting down or standing up. So it's kind of an already pretty accessible activity. This is a picture of our plant in place. We did a couple of trial runs before we did the actual camp, um, an hour and a half um, <clears throat> adventure day, which was a lot of fun. The first picture on the right was a very rainy day, and we were kind of bummed out, but it ended up, the kids were thriving in it, and it ended up being a great experience. And then the other side, obviously, is super sunny and beautiful. So again, rain or shine, it was perfect. So again, I'm briefly just going to talk about kind of the nuts and bolts for professionals. So again, like I said, we have that professional toy lending program. So your facility is able to take five or more toys out from our library each month. You can you know, talk to me about what your story time is, what kinds of 
kids are coming in to your library, what kind of special needs there are. And you know, we kind of position ourselves at, at Ecotech experts on toys. So we can really help find the best toys that will fit your needs at your library, whatever you're working on. Um, like I said, those webinars, the webinars do offer continuing education credit, which I think is also valuable for people at therapists or teachers or whoever is trying to collect all those credits. Um, we provide that for you. Are those real? They're not mail. They, they're, they're picked up at the center. So how much is, is it, this a part of a professional membership then? So the professional membership is actually $500 for the full year. Again, that can be broken down into payment, payments too. Um, and we do have options for, um, sometimes five toys isn't enough, especially if there's multiple people in your library wanting to use the toys for different programs or whatever it is. Um, you're able to, um, we can do like seven toys at a different rate and we can kind of work on what that would look like. So so if you wanted to, um, like I'm at Vernon area up in Lincolnshire, so if we were to buy a professional membership, would we also have to pay um, for you to come in to do sensory story times at our library? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the sensory story times are $250 um, plus mileage.
So at LecoTech, we have over 8,000 toys in our inventory. So that's why we try to fit, you know, we have these prescriptive toys and try to fit the needs of anybody that we're working with. What do you need? We have it. We have trampolines. We have sensory items. We have special toys that are special for kids with special needs um, in a whole wide variety. So Able Play is because of that, because we're able to try out all these new toys. We're able to help um, talking about different prototypes with different toy manufacturers and say, hey, this needs to be a little bit longer. This knob is too little. Nobody's going to be able to pick that up. Or, hey, this needs more contrasting colors because it's hard to see. Or, hey, you need to add a musical element to this because this toy is boring. <laughs> Whatever it may be, you know, we're trying to offer that support because we have a big study group. Or, you know, what, what is that called? A focus group. We can go to libraries. I can pull that, you know, when I'm bringing toys or products into a library setting, I get the feedback from the parents and the kids there. In my sessions, from the professionals that we work with, um, we have librarians, we have physical therapists, occupational, um, developmental, we have a number of, and teachers, special educators, whoever it may be, and they can provide us with this great feedback. I just have a question about the toys. Yeah. Um, do they sign some sort of a liability thing? Like, I'm thinking about a trampoline. Mm -hmm. And let's say we bring a trampoline in, and then we let somebody take it, and they're kickers themselves. Yeah. Could they sue the library? Could they sue you? Do we say, you're using this, and we're not responsible? You are have to watch your child when you're doing it? I mean, yeah. what about stuff like that? That's a great question. Um, and I don't know if I have an entirely good answer for it. Okay. <laughs> um, at LACO Tech, I mean, we have an insurance when they're there. So if they're using the, the trampoline at LACO Tech, then we're covered. If they take it home, we don't have any liability, anything. They don't sign anything. Um, so that's done, you know, at their own risk. I mean, also, we didn't manufacture the toy. We didn't make the toy. So that also kind of, I don't want to say lets us off the hook, but we're not as tied to that. Um, but at a library, I'm assuming it might be the same thing. It's saying that you have some liability coverage here at the library in general if, if an accident does happen. Um, but that's something that I can look into and find out some more information. And I just had another question yeah. about the field trips. I think those sound really awesome. Yeah. But do the parents all know that somebody, like, do people want to kind of say, okay, you're going on a field trip, and don't the parents have to come with them? Or is that always known that parts of the family, they don't want to just send their child by themselves? Yeah, um, that's something we always have to kind of tell them. We, none of our programs, our story times, our camps, anything that is a drop-off program. So all of them are going to be involved with the family, whether they have siblings or not, or aunts and uncles or whatever. The parents are going to be involved, whether it's mom or dad. So um, I think people that have been with Laco Tech for a while know that that's kind of an unspoken thing, but sometimes you have to tell them that for different programs just popping your kid down as a babysitter and we're going to take them to the museum. You know, the parents are, are really going to be involved. I'm just there as a helper, facilitator. <laughs> yeah. How uh, would we get more of these postcards? This would be a great thing to put out in the department. I have a bunch. I'll give them to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, and again, like I said, our new website is coming out in December, so we'll have some new ones. So as soon as those come, I can replenish okay. um, your stock. The Toys R Us guide that you mentioned, is it available online on their website or anywhere else? It is, it is. Um, it is, and it has a really straight name, but it is the Toys R Us guide for differently abled children. We didn't have anything to do with the title. It's been that way for like 25 years. <laughs> um, but it is available online, and it is available in stores. Um, sometimes they're a little hidden, which is stinks. But you can just go up to, they, they all know about it, so you can go up to the front and just say, hey, do you have a Toys R Us guide for these unable kids? And they'll, they'll find you something. Do you have a question? I did. Um, earlier, I, I thought I heard you say something like about Brain Gym. Was it Gym or Gym? Yeah. What is Brain Gym? Gym. Oh, this is my expertise. Um, it is a philosophy, philosophy on connecting the right and left brain and all these different exercises that you can do for for infants all the way up into adulthood. So there's different things to help calming and kind of being able to, techniques to kind of regulate yourself if you're feeling stressed or if you're in a hospital and there's kind of other stress going on or if you're trying to get to sleep or you're stressed from your day or kids are just having a hard time with some of their needs. Um, she taught us a bunch of techniques on how to regulate yourself and de-stress. Yeah, look it up, Brain Gym. Any other questions? Yeah. And this is backing up a little bit. On that $500 professional membership, can you go 
over what that would cover? Like you mentioned the toys. So yeah. You toys monthly. Yeah. So that covers the toys that you get each month. We also will put you in for a raffle each month because we do raffle off toys each month. And so some professionals do win because we'll put you into the raffle pot. Um, the webinars and the training and educational opportunities, those are all going to be covered as well. The training and education opportunities. The webinars, the, we have monthly webinars. Okay. So and it's all online for library staff. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. And then you said something about the CEUs and teacher training. That yeah. is the, what you would have to then have $250 for. No, so the webinars, the webinars offer the continuing education credit, and those are going to be free for the libraries or whoever is involved in our professional toy lending program. Okay. As well as we have, we host um, specific trainings at our LACO Tech Center, and those would be free for anybody who would like to participate in it as well. But if we wanted you to come out, and if you wanted us to come out to your library, it would be a cost. It would be the two hundred fifty dollars for trainings. It's five hundred. Um, but for sensory story times, it's $250. Oh, okay. Yeah, our trainings are normally two and a half hour workshops, so they're really hands on. They're, they're really great trainings, but they are about two and a half hours um, and, and really many, hands on. How many people can attend those? As many as. <laughs> and then the webinars are um, included with membership for the library staff. What types of things are provided? Are they learning that? Are they learning specifics with the toys? We try to get experts in all different areas. Okay. So one, you know, one time we had somebody talking about managing tantrums. Um, our, our audience is pretty broad. We have parents on there a lot. We have professionals. We have librarians, educators, all those people I was talking about. Right. So our topics always have um, a play component into them because that's our biggest philosophy is talking about play. But you know, our last one was just about um, trying to be a child's advocate. What does that look like? Techniques and strategies to be a child's advocate. Yeah, which was really good, right? Um, and then again, like I said, we're gonna have another, little, another one talking about medical trauma um, for children with special needs. Um, we have another one talking about picky eaters. We have another one talking about reinventing uh, libraries, inclusive, uh, reinventing libraries, inclusion and advocacy. It was more, more like advocating for libraries for parents who may not think of the library as a place to visit. And all of these are archived too. Yes, and all of these are archived. The archived ones don't offer continuing education credit because that's just not allowed, but the live ones do offer that continuing education credit. And then would it be something that we could, as like part of our monthly story time thing, also offer an adult component where we show the webinar to like the story time sensory parents? Yeah, I, I, for the parents? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't see. So if see. we had the professional membership, would it be something that once a month we could also say, you know, please stay and if you would like to enjoy this webinar with us, we can do that or? We can that? talk about that. We usually, we usually just say it's for the staff. Okay. Um, because normally that's kind of a perk and incentive of our membership is right. to, or the professional item is to have those webinars, but they're normally $30 for people that are non leco tech members. So we give it to the staff. And do you have a group rate for that? that um, we do, like we that? do. I don't have those specific okay. numbers. It kind of, it works on a, on a slide, a sliding scale. Okay. Um, but I can, I can talk to you after. And, and that would just be for a webinar kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of the topics you talked about seem like really helpful. Yeah, and, and definitely I think the archived ones, I think that, you could show. I think that would be fine. The ones that are live, though, I because those we wouldn't be able to provide. It would be archived because it would have to be very specific, you know, time times. Set. Yeah, because ours are like Wednesdays from ten to eleven, <laughs> or like eleven to twelve, or something normally. So, yeah. Would you happen to know uh, the mileage that you? Because I live way up in Gurney. Point so, five six. Huh? Point five six. Point five six a mile. Thank yes. you. Right? Yeah, that's a standard standard rate. Yeah. I'm just intrigued by your job. Yeah. People that work at Lucky Tech, do you guys all have like special ed degrees? Um, it varies. I'm actually a CTRS, so I'm a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. Um, so I studied therapeutic recreation in school and then I got my certification. And really that's just talking about working with really anybody that has a special need or a disability and just trying to find their way back into leisure and recreation. What does that look like? 
Um, so I did a lot of volunteer work at nursing homes and worked at an animal-assisted therapy barn and a different, bunch of different places. Um, but what's a little unique that I think that um, we bring to LACO Tech and a couple of other staff, I have siblings with disabilities, and I think that that sometimes that creating that warm, friendly, accepting environment is one thing that is hard. We work with families that they, their first child, they have a disability, and now they're supposed to be an expert on disabilities when they don't, maybe they don't even know anybody with a disability or haven't really worked with them before, and now they're supposed to say, now they're supposed to be experts on their child, um, which is a little discouraging sometimes. But I can come in and say, I've been around disabilities my entire life. I know all about it, well not all about it, but I know many things and I know that you know, children, of, that's why we use that phrase, children of all abilities, because even at Lacotech, we don't require a diagnosis. You don't need to tell me that your child has Down syndrome. I mean, those things are helpful, but you don't have to have a diagnosis. And I think that's um, free, because families are always so focused on that diagnosis. They're so focused on the limitations that their child can't do instead of focusing on saying, hey, you know, he does need help with his left side of his body because it's a little weak. That is a lot better than saying, you know, throwing out this different jargon and saying, you know, he has cerebral palsy and he's got spastic arms on his right, you know, on his left side. Um, and I think, you know, having that attitude and that comfortability and that um, not thinking that these kids are so special and fragile keep using that word special, they're obviously everyone's special, but that they're so fragile that you can't really engage them and play and do the same things that in rough house than like you normally would do with any kid um, in a story time at home, you know, wherever it is. So um, that's kind of a unique position perspective that I've brought in to Laco Tech, but it's a fun job. <laughs> it's a fun job, definitely. Are any of these programs run in different languages? Um, we do. We serve a lot of Spanish-speaking families, so we do have a bilingual play specialist that run, leads a lot of our trainings, and we try to do our play groups bilingual um, and try to you know, use both um, because kids are learning Chinese now and Cantonese and, and whatever. So we're always trying that. Um, I don't speak a ton of Spanish, so sometimes it's hard, but um, Spanish is our only. are all really great questions. Haley, may I just throw in one more perk that yeah. you didn't mention yet for the professional membership? Yeah. Um, you're given, is it so a, a number of certificates? Oh, yes, yes. To give to the families? Yeah, so we have um, like coupons that we give to the, the libraries or whoever, the staff, to be able to distribute to either their staff or to the families that they see. So it's a free, a uh, couple of free coupons for our play groups. So if they are looking for more programming for their child with special needs um, and for a free opportunity, normally they're $10 anyway, so it's a lot lower of a price for a lot of other play groups when you go to, in, out into the community. Um, but those are, are free for them to come and just try it out, try out the Leco Tech program, kind of see if it is a good fit, as well as um, coupons for training. So if you do have a parent that comes into your library all the time, they have a child with a special need, and maybe they need a little bit more help on trying to figure out ways to make it accessible or to access play or whatever it is, you can give them that coupon and then they can um, take that and come to one of our trainings. Yeah. Um, come to your center, where do they live? I mean, do they travel? They do. Since it is only once a month, um, and we are, we do have evenings. We're available on the evenings as well as Saturdays, too. Um, they do travel from, you know, farther distances. Not, I want to say, we have one family from, like, Indiana and, like, Valparaiso, which they kind of just make a Saturday day trip of it. You know, they come in, they get toys, they have lunch, you know, go to Costco, and they go home. Um, so... I think it's a little bit more manageable that it is once a month mm -hmm. to do it because we also don't want this to be something that's stressful. Like I was always saying, we're always trying to create this kind of fail-free environment for these families to come into and what does that look like. So we don't want you to be running around rushing and oh, you know, I didn't get all the pieces to the toys and I don't know, we broke this one or whatever it is. We want this to be a very, you know, positive, positive environment for these families to come in. So I think having it once a month is for travel reasons and for scheduling reasons, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, 
Yeah, so evenings, evenings are an option in the Saturday. Are there any thoughts of a satellite spot? Because I just, the whole thought, like, what you just You want to start one? <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, that, that's, in the Southwest, yeah, uh, I mean, we what? have, we have 17 affiliates, and the Laco Tech program can look different in so many different areas. So there's actually, in Franklin Park, in the kind of the Oak Park um, district at the WSSRA, the West Suburban Special Rack Association, there is a Laco Tech there. There is a Lecotec at the children at Lurie Children's Hospital as well, which looks a little different. That's led by a child life specialist, um, so she utilizes the toys from Lecotec to use with her, within child life, but actually runs Lecotec play sessions too. Um, we, you know, there. What's another one? There's one at the UCP. There's one in an Easter Seals. No park districts. That would be the. Um. Now, no park districts right no now. Just real briefly, I know I'm running out of time, but um, back in 2000, we used to have over 60 sites, Lecotec sites, and in 2008, when you know everything crashed, um, a lot of our funding cut because we are nonprofits and we rely pretty heavily on grants and are able. That's why I say our money makers, you know, our direct service. What I do doesn't really make a lot, a lot of money. You know, these programs do, and so a lot of the Lecotecs were self-standing and they couldn't sustain through. So they had to refigure what does the Lecotec program look like. We've had to refigure, you know, what we do. So in 2008, we has anybody familiar with Annexer Center? Annexer Center is um, another nonprofit organization. It's a, a huge organization that has works work. Um, work services, employment services, there's Chicago Hearing Society is involved with them, and Lecotec is actually a division off the Annexer Center. So they kind of took us under their wing, they gave us cheap rent, and now we can kind of just do do what we do. And we're always, like I said, our goal is to get one in every state, at least one. We got North Dakota, check. So, <laughs> continue. Annexer, A-N-I-X-T-E-R Center. Mm -hmm. So they have like villas and they have Housing options and a number of different things available. Yeah. As far as your monthly sessions in Chicago, do you typically see more severe, profound children, or is there um, a good balance between mild disabilities in there too? Or I mean, it's pretty. It's a pretty wide range. We do have some kids that. You know, mom is just worried about dad playing with the son because he might have a little bit of a speech delay. We'll have that. Or we'll have somebody that we actually have to go and do a home visit for because she's, you know, isolated to her bed and has, you know, intense allergies and, you know, a lowered immune system and we have to do that and really not able to access toys. So we have a pretty wide range of abilities um, with, and especially, and I didn't even get back to some of our adaptive toys, about what those look like, and switches and different communication devices. And those are kind of geared to a lot of our kids that are, are more severe and profound, whether it's cognitively or physically. Um, being able to activate um, a button as opposed to squeezing a hand is easier to do for somebody that has some severe physical limitations. So it really is, I, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer because it's just pretty, it's all over the board. Um, so I will encourage you guys to play with some of these toys. That big spaceship looking thing um, is, is a busy box. And that, just to kind of give you a price point, that's about $400. Um, and families, whether you're well off or not, nobody's going to buy a $400 toy, especially if it's only going to meet those developmental skills for maybe a year, maybe less than a year, you know, six months or so. Um, but the point of adaptive toys is that they're kind of, they're very multi-sensory and they're really exciting and engaging. Um, for a child that might not typically really get those same responses from toys that are just off the shelf. Um, and really being able to easily activate and access the toy I think is really important. That's why um, some of these, you know, these this puzzle doesn't look super special but it has big knobs and has all these different textures. And they're actually underneath it has Velcro so they actually have to pull up um, different stacking things and busy boxes. All things that are easy, easier to activate. Um, and, and working on different skills. Um, these are a couple of different switches. We have big ones, we have doorbell ones. If you're working on finger isolation and you want to activate that puppy, well, you need to get your finger out and press it. Um, and different communication switches. 
We are a little bit more low tech at Laco Tech, um, just because maybe a lot of the play specialists aren't very tech savvy. I don't know if that's why, but when the iPads had come out, obviously they're very accessible and they're an amazing tool to be able to use. But now we don't really use them as much at Laco Tech. When we first got, we got this grant, we got all these iPads. Now we kind of steer away from it just a little bit because they're playing their iPad on the way to Laco Tech. They're playing it in the car on the way back home to Laco Tech. Now they're eating it, using it before dinner and then going to bed, you know, falling asleep to whatever it is. So we've kind of steered away from the iPad play especially since our demographic is zero to eight years old. They don't necessarily need to be really super engaged in all of that. Yeah. Um, so that's, oh, and with my, my mentor, Dr. Seuss. Uh, look at me, look at me now. It's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. And that's all we're trying to do at Laco Tech. It's just talking about different ways to access play and how do we all play, um, especially with children of all abilities.